Well, thank you, Carter. It's a great pleasure to be here and a, certainly a privilege. I'm delighted that this conference is focused primarily on solutions. At the same time, Tom Lovejoy and I have a narrower remit, which is to talk about the problem, the character of which needs to drive those solutions. There are always two pitfalls, in a way, two traps in talking about big societal problems and their solutions. One trap is talking so much about the problem and not enough about solutions that people are paralyzed. The other problem, though, is starting to talk about solutions in great detail before people are in agreement about what the problem is and what its characteristics are that need to drive the uh, solutions. And so we're going to try to get that right in this, uh, in this opening session uh, from me and Tom Lovejoy and then let uh, the rest of the speakers and the whole group uh, focus on that crucial issue of, uh, of what the solutions are. Uh, so I want to start with uh, a few absolutely essential summary points and then elaborate on them a bit. The first point is that global warming is in fact a misnomer, as widely used as it is. It's a misnomer because it implies something that's gradual, that's uniform, that's mostly about temperature, and that's quite possibly benign. And the fact is that what's happening is the opposite of all of those things. It's rapid compared to the capacity of societies and ecosystems to adjust. It's highly non-uniform. Uh, across the planet, across regions, across countries. It affects not just temperature, but everything about climate. And although it may be good for a limited time for a few people in a few places, overall it's almost entirely harmful. Uh, that means that a more accurate term would be global climatic disruption. That's a big mouthful, but at least it's not wrong. That ongoing disruption is real without any doubt. It is mainly caused by humans. It's already producing significant harm, and this may be the part that is less widely understood still than the other two, that this is not a problem for our children and our grandchildren. It is a problem for us right now, people living all around the world, and it is growing more rapidly than almost anybody expected even a few years ago. You need to start, really, with a common understanding, get everybody on the same page, about what climate change, climate disruption actually means. And the key thing is that climate is the pattern of weather, the averages, the extremes, the timing, the spatial distribution of not just temperature, but everything about weather. And when the climate changes, those patterns are what change. People need to understand that the global average surface temperature is just an index of the state of the global climate as expressed in those patterns, just as your body temperature is an index of the state of your body. When your body temperature goes from 98.6 to 103 or 104, you don't say, well, what's a few degrees among friends? I don't care about that. It's not very much. You know that that modest change in degrees Fahrenheit represents a big change in the state of your body, and you better do something about it or you're going to be dead. And the same thing is true with climate. Changes of a few degrees represent large changes in the climatic patterns that govern what we do and what we cannot do, how we live and how we cannot live on this planet. Climate change governs practically everything that matters to us. Climate is the envelope within which all other environmental conditions and processes have to function. If you distort that envelope enough, you affect and disrupt all those other environmental conditions and processes. And just a few of the items that everybody can elaborate on for themselves that are governed by climate in a very intimate way and without which uh, we're in deep trouble, uh, the laundry list of what's, uh, of what's really at stake here. Earth is getting hotter. There's no question about it. This is the uh, instrumental record through 2007. The instrumental record means the thermometer record. This is about 125 years long. That's the period of time in which there were enough thermometer measurements over the land and over the ocean to meaningfully define a global average surface temperature. There were thermometers before that, but there weren't enough of them to really know what the global average surface temperature, that crucial index, was. Uh, if you look at these data, what you find is that not only was 2005 the hottest year on record, 2007 tied with 98 as the second hottest, but the 14 hottest years in the whole 125-year record all occurred since 1990. 24 out of the 25 hottest all occurred since 1980. Anybody in the room who's a statistician can do a calculation in the margin of your notebook that tells you how unlikely it is that such a pattern could have materialized at random. This is not 
uh, a random occurrence. Uh, more importantly, we know what has caused that heating. This summarizes the IPCC's 2007 view of the relative size of the influences on global climate, human and natural, over this time period now going back to 1750, the nominal start of the Industrial Revolution. You don't need to care too much about the units. These are what climatologists call forcings, literally how hard you're pushing on the climate with one influence or another. You see that the biggest forcing by far is the buildup over this period in atmospheric carbon dioxide, set of other globally mixed greenhouse gases, methane, nitrous oxide, chlorofluorocarbons coming in second, some positive contributions from ozone and soot, black particles that warm the atmosphere by absorbing additional sunlight and warm the surface of the earth as well. Some offsetting negative effects by particles that humans have put in the atmosphere, reflective particles, cloud forming particles. Uh, a bit of change, uh, sorry for the paragraphing there, a bit of change from land use change, converting forests to grasslands, grasslands to desert, increasing the reflectivity of the planet. And the natural changes, by comparison, the best estimate of the dominant natural change over this period is the change in sunlight reaching the Earth, and it is about uh, a thirtieth of the warming influence of the greenhouse gases and the black soot, a thirtieth. Anybody who tells you the sun is changing this, is dominating this, is smoking dope. It's just not right. Uh, <clears throat> we not only know in overall terms what has been driving this warming, but we know that the carbon dioxide increase, the methane increase, the other principal increases on that list are in fact human caused. This shows a um, a 10,000 year time scale with the last uh, 200 or so in the, in the inset of the atmospheric concentrations of carbon dioxide and methane. You see this absolutely extraordinary spike which uh, accompanied uh, the Industrial Revolution. We know even more than just from this pattern that the carbon dioxide came mostly from fossil fuels. We know that because fossil fuel carbon contains no carbon-14. The rest of the short-term cycling carbon in the atmosphere and the biosphere contains lots of carbon-14, and you can actually see the dilution effect in the carbon-14 concentration of the atmosphere and stored in tree rings that comes from that increase in fossil fuel burning uh, over the years. This is what I call the smoking gun. This is from Jim Hansen's group at the Goddard Institute for Space Studies, NASA lab, uh, that does a lot of the best studies of climate change. What you see in the top panel is our best understanding of the time trajectories of the human and natural forcings over the period of the instrumental record, 1880 to 2005. The red line rising rapidly in the top panel left to right is the greenhouse gases. The blue line that is spiky and goes negative are volcanic eruptions where particulate matter added to the atmosphere by volcanoes temporarily cools the Earth, and then as those particles fall out of the stratosphere, the Earth eventually comes back to normal. And the significant thing here is that the bottom panel shows what happens when you take a current state-of-the-art global climate model and you feed it those known forcings over this 125 years. What happens is the climate model reproduces almost perfectly the global temperature trajectory for this period. In other words, if you tell the climate model what we know we have done to the atmosphere and the surface of the Earth over this period, the model spits out the temperature record that has actually been observed. The biggest cause is the 150 plus years of world energy growth driven primarily by fossil fuels. This is the picture, 1850 to 2000. The biomass fuels are at the bottom. That's fuel wood, charcoal, crop waste, and dung. In 1850, those were the dominant sources of world energy. They're still important, particularly to the two billion poorest people in the world who get most of their energy from those traditional sources. But you see the growth over the last 150 years was driven initially by the expansion of coal. That's the brown band. Subsequently, in the last 50 years, at twice the rate of the preceding 100 in terms of growth, dominated by the growth of oil and natural gas, which, with some additional growth from coal, and just little bits of nuclear and hydro and expanded biomass in there, but this is a fossil fuel dominated world. More than 80 percent of the world energy supply in 2000 was coming from fossil fuels, and that continues to be true. The 2006 data show the world 82 percent dependent on fossil fuels, the United States 88 percent, China 84, and so on. 
Fossil fuel emissions from developing countries are catching up. Up until now, the industrial nations have dominated, but as Carter Bales already mentioned, China passed the United States last year uh, as uh, an emitter of carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases in total. And that pattern will continue. The developing countries will dominate from about 2015 uh, onward. It now looks like uh, what this tells us about solutions is twofold. Number one, in terms of historical responsibility, the industrialized countries bear most of it. That means we should go first. We should lead. We should pay many of the high initial costs. But the pattern as it is emerging also means that there is no solution to this problem unless the developing countries join a global framework for reducing these emissions relatively quickly. Uh, deforestation uh, is the second biggest driver. It is now primarily in the tropics. You see from this historical view of deforestation that initially the deforestation was taking place in the, uh, in the non-tropical regions, the temperate and boreal zones, the United States, Europe, Russia, and so on. Now we are a modest sink in that part of the world, and the deforestation emissions are coming primarily from tropical Africa, tropical uh, America, principally uh, South America and, uh, and tropical Asia. And those emissions, although there is some uncertainty about them not shown here, amount to between 15 and 25 percent of the global emissions of carbon dioxide, except in very dry years where tropical burning can boost that to 30 or 35 uh, percent of global emissions. Coming back to the heating, I mentioned the problem is non-uniform. This is the picture of average surface temperature increases 2001 to 2005 compared to a baseline period from 50 to 80. The average surface temperature increase in that period was half a degree centigrade, and yet, as you see from the scale, which shows three to four times that increase in the far north and in parts of Antarctica, the increases are far, far bigger in some parts of the world than the global average. They're higher on land than over the oceans. They're higher in the center of the continents than at the edges, and they're highest of all in the far north. That is why the far north and a part of Antarctica are the canary in the coal mine in this case, showing us bigger impacts because the temperature changes and associated pattern changes are larger there. That uneven heating changes wind patterns. An example of that is the weakening of the East Asia monsoon. This is the monsoon that governs precipitation over much of China. The interesting thing is the monsoon has been declining steadily for more than 30 years, and the decline matches predictions by Chinese climate modelers of what global climatic change is expected to do to the circulation patterns over, over China. This, by the way, has had a big effect on the understanding of Chinese policymakers about China's stake in this issue. China no longer thinks that this is just a problem for the industrialized countries because they realize now how climate change is already harming them. I'll come back to that in a minute. Glaciers are shrinking uh, all around the world. Lots of before and, before and after pictures uh, showing this. You can go on the web and find dozens of pictures of glaciers all over the world retreating in this kind of pattern. Permafrost is thawing. That, of course, means that highways, buildings, bridges, pipelines uh, sink, sag, collapse, and crack uh, under the result. Arctic summer sea ice is disappearing. September 2005 set a record for the period of satellite observation going back to about 1979. The long-term average in that period of satellite observation is shown by the magenta line. That's the average extent of sea ice in September. 2005 set a record for low extent of September sea ice. It caused ice specialists to conclude that the sea ice might be entirely gone at the end of summer by 2040 instead of by 2070, which was their previous estimate. 2007 came along, as you see, it absolutely shattered the 2005 record. Now the ice specialists say the ice could be entirely gone by 2013. Okay, so a few years ago it was 2070, now it's 2013. Why do we care? This is not a sea level issue. This is floating ice. When it melts, sea level doesn't go up. What it does is it changes drastically the reflectivity of the northern regions. When it's sea ice, most of the sunlight that hits it gets reflected back to space. When it's blue water, most of the sunlight gets absorbed. The drastic difference in energy balance in the northern regions that results when the sea ice is gone drastically changes the circulation patterns of the whole northern hemisphere. This is a tipping point among a number of tipping points which climate scientists are worried about. 
Surface melting on Greenland has been expanding. This shows 92, 2002, and 2005, each year setting a record for the extent of surface melting on the Greenland ice sheet. This now is land ice, and when it melts, sea level does go up. 2007 beat the 2005 record by at least 10 percent. The imagery is not ready yet, but the whole picture of continuously accelerating change uh, is continuing in that domain. Those changes are already causing harm. This is the harm that's been caused by the change in the East Asia monsoon in China. Less moisture flow from south to north, increased flooding in the south, drought in the north. Again, these are Chinese data. These are not uh, results that Western scientists are telling the Chinese they need to pay attention to. These data were first shown to me by the deputy head of the Climate Office in the National Development and Reform Commission, the most powerful planning body in China. Incidence of flooding is up, in fact, almost everywhere. Major floods by decade, 50 to 2,000. Uh, drastic uh, pattern all over the world, the biggest increases in Asia. Wildfires, this is one of the sleepers, in my view. Conditions that govern wildfires are extremely sensitive to average temperature. Wildfires in the western United States have gone up fourfold in the last 30 years, and this is happening all over the world. And tropical cyclones, this is uh, one of the more controversial linkages, but the evidence is uh, becoming extremely powerful. This is some of the best evidence here relating the total power released by tropical cyclones, not just whether it's category five or category four or category three, but over what area and for how long it's in what category. So the total energy dissipated by these tropical storms, which is a measure of their destructiveness, correlated here with the mean sea surface temperature in the cyclone spawning regions, hurricanes in the Atlantic, typhoons in the Pacific. The correlation is absolutely extraordinary. It's not fully understood how this works, and this is what people need to understand. The arguments are about why the models aren't better at getting this right. But these are the observational data, and the observational data show that the power of tropical cyclones is exceptionally well correlated with the sea surface temperatures, which global climate change is increasing. The melting land ice and the thermal expansion of ocean water are raising sea level. Sea level is now going up at a rate twice the average of the 20th century and is expected to continue to accelerate. Nobody knows by how much because we do not understand and cannot model the mechanisms by which rising temperatures can produce accelerated disintegration of the ice sheets. We do know that it has happened multiple times in the past under climate change forcings that are weaker than the ones we are experiencing today. Under business as usual, we are headed for much bigger disruptions. This just shows the history, some of the trajectories from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. The target embraced by the European Union in 2002 was the world should seek to avoid going above 2 degrees centigrade above the pre-industrial level, about the same as the 1900 level. The last time the global average surface temperature was 2 degrees C above the 1900 level was 130,000 years ago. Sea level then was 4 to 6 meters higher than today. We are headed probably for 3 degrees C if we continue with business as usual by 2100. The last time the world was that warm was about 30 million years ago when my colleague Dan Schrag likes to point out there were crocodiles swimming off of Greenland and palm trees in Wyoming, a drastically different uh, climate than the one we have today, and sea level was 20 to 30 meters higher than it is today. Past IPCC assessments, this is important, have underestimated the rate of growth of emissions. This shows uh, what has happened in the last couple of years compared to the IPCC's trajectories of just a few years ago. Emissions are above the high end of the IPCC trajectory. The rate of growth of the concentration of carbon dioxide is itself growing. That is shown here. Impact variables, temperature, sea level rise have been at the high ends of the 2001 IPCC scenario range. And if you ask what more is in store, one of the things that is in store is more heat waves. This is a slide that repays study, although it's a little complicated. This is the summer temperature, July and August, in the part of Central Europe, which in 2003 experienced a summer heat wave that killed 35,000 people, mostly in France and Spain and in Italy. That heat wave is the asterisk at the end of a spike just past 2000 in this particular picture. The historical 
trends and the computer simulations are on the left, and what you see in the continuing simulations to the right is that that 2003 summer in Central Europe, which was a one in 100 year event at the time it occurred, will be a one in two year event by 2040, and it will be an unusually cool year in Central Europe by 2070. Droughts, big increases in droughts expected in many parts of the world. All you have to know about this diagram is yellow is bad, orange is worse, brown is horrible in terms of the increase in the intensity and frequency and duration of droughts. And you see the picture, many, many parts of the world, crucial parts of the world, badly afflicted by drought. And something that I'm sure Tom Lovejoy will have more to say about is the biggest brown blob is right in the middle of the Amazon. What's in store for sea level? We know that melting the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets, all of them would raise sea level by something like 70 meters. The conventional wisdom has been that that would take thousands of years. But we now know that rates of 2 to 5 meters per century are possible because it's happened at least twice in the last 19,000 years uh, as a result of natural forcings over that period. These panels show what would happen to the southeastern United States. Under a 7 meter rise, that's if you lose the whole Greenland ice sheet. 12 meters is if you lose Greenland and the West Antarctic. That's at the lower left. And the lower right is what if you lose the whole shooting match. And of course, the coastline is no longer recognizable. This is one I like. We should all ask what sea level rise would mean in our region. Uh, this shows what it would mean to Cape Cod and the Boston area where I live. Uh, this always has a dramatic effect on audiences at Harvard and MIT. Uh, <laughs> and that is the end of my remarks, and I'm going to turn it over to Tom Lovejoy to tell us what the impacts on the biosphere are likely to be, and then we'll have questions uh, at the end of that.